Hi, I just wanted to set the stage for this keynote. Uh, the speaker is Xander Rose, who I've known for many years. Um, he's the executive director of a nonprofit foundation called the Long Now Foundation. And I, a lot of my thinking about how to make InterSource Commons a sustainable movement comes out of their thinking, the Long Now Foundation's thinking and research into sustainability. And um, Long Now is a way to think about an event horizon that's longer than the next product turn. And uh, when I started working on this foundation, um, InterSource Commons, I wanted uh, something that would last beyond me and something that would help make open source more sustainable ultimately by teaching companies how to use open source methods inside their proprietary organizations. We teach them how to collaborate more effectively in public as well. And uh, anyway, Xander kind of launches into this talk. So I wanted to give you some context and um, what it is that I'm hoping you'll be listening for. And then at the end, I'll come back in and say some more. I'm going to, um, I'm going to start this talk with a, a story and it's a story that actually got um, the Long Now Foundation where I work started. And it was, um, story of these beams and um, the beams at New College Oxford were were put in in the 1200s when the college was built. It wasn't until 500 years later when uh, these beams needed to be replaced and the school didn't know quite what to do because you couldn't buy trees like this anymore in Europe and it wasn't until they spoke to the school forester who said well we have the trees that you planted and um, and you know this kind of simple act of uh, acorns being spread on the ground and then um, also having the kind of uh, organizational continuity to remember that you, they had done this, this process so that you could solve this uh, intractable problem by leveraging longevity uh, through you know, five centuries. It was this kind of thinking that uh, when this story was first told to um, our our founders, uh, Danny Hillis and Stuart Brand, um, that realized that this kind of thinking wasn't happening anymore. And Danny Hillis had spent his uh, earliest years working uh, on a, basically the fastest supercomputers in the world out of MIT and then with his company, uh, Thinking Machines. And so he had always been kind of pushed to do things faster and faster. And and Stuart Brand, who had, uh, who had started the Whole Earth Catalog back in the 60s and has been an author and technology pundit since, um, realized that uh, that in these kind of stories and and in getting our attention around uh, some longer term thinking and and understanding some of the things that you can only solve on a on a on a long time span such as climate change or hunger um, or education all of these things um, require kind of bearing down on over over generations and in some cases centuries or even thousands of years to truly solve and and this conversation sprung up among who became the the founding board including brian eno who coined this term the long now when he he moved from uh england to to new york he realized that when people said now in new york they meant a very different thing uh than when they said now in in england and they in england they meant kind of the current time that we are in not the five minutes that we're in so he called he used this term the long now which we've uh, adopted and all the the people that really started long now, um, like Danny and Stewart and and uh, people like Esther Dyson and Kevin Kelly, they were really part of the early wave of um, of the digital culture here coming out of California, and. Um, and we're seeing some of the pitfalls of only fetishizing speed and that if we were going to solve some of these larger world problems, we needed to have some kind of balancing corrective around this. And so Danny um, thought that a kind of uh, basically building the slowest computer rather than the fastest computer uh, might be an interesting uh, kind of icon as a way of focusing people on the longer term. And so he had this idea of a, of a millennial clock that would tick once a year and bong once a century and the cuckoo would come out once a millennium built at a large enough scale that people, you know, would have to kind of confront it and it could be part of storytelling and myth building. And Stuart Brand loved that idea, but also thought there should be an information com component around it, basically a library on the same order, it's kind of millennial scale library. 
And then the conversation really started around it. And, and one of the first questions was, you know, what is the time scale that we should be pushing for? What is the right kind of human moment? We wanted to push it further than, um, you know, your average five year plan, obviously, but if you you know if you're using infinite time scales or even astronomic time scales like this you're in the kind of billions of years which is really dwarfing to the human experience or even geologic time scales of millions of years um, is also very dwarfing to the human experience so this idea of um of looking at the last and next 10,000 years uh, became the the thought is that basically the last ice age retreated about 8,000 bc first cities um, started coming not long after that but this was really the human kind of technological moment and um, and I think the most important thing about this diagram here is is this idea that not only are we um, you know it's not just that we are at the end of a 10,000 year story we are in the middle of a 20,000 year story we have at least as much time in front of us in this human moment as we do behind us and i mean i think we often are thinking about ourselves as kind of the end game rather than um having this much time in front of us and 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 how would we would make decisions differently if we th were thinking about the next 10,000 years as much as the last and when I first started at Long Now, um, I worked on this diagram with uh, that came out of a conversation with uh, Stuart Brand and Brian Eno, trying to kind of tease apart these layers of uh, time called the pace layers. And um, you know, on the very outside layers, uh, fashion and uh, even communications technology may be out there now at this point, um, most frenetic and fastest layers, and then coming down through commerce and infrastructure and governance and culture, and then nature moving the slowest and batting last but you know looking at the way that maybe um you might make a decision and how it affects all of these layers if you're if you are uh, a company or even a person um you know, for instance, when um, when Maxam Corporation uh, was, which was a company that basically bought companies for their assets and would sell the assets um, for more than they bought the company for, um, they they did that with a lot of kind of human based companies. Um, but at one point, they bought Pacific Lumber. And when they bought Pacific Lumber, the assets of that of that company obviously were um, old growth redwoods, and so they were worth more than the company. And so they started just chopping them down and selling them in a, in a highly unsustainable way. And so they had basically they had skipped, you know, they they were working out here on this commerce layer, and they had skipped all of these layers and were basically cutting something down that's on this n nature layer, that. Uh, could not be replaced in thousands and thousands of years, if ever. And um, and then all of a sudden, governance systems got upset, cultural systems got upset, infrastructure systems got upset, and then they eventually a lot of these trees were protected. Some were cut down, um, but it was it's a good example of how if you skip a lot of these layers, you can kind of you can kind of upset the the balance of um, of how we move through time and the kind of pace layering of human time. But this is the site that we're building at. Um, the, the clock project is funded by Jeff Bezos. Um, and this is uh, property out near where uh, one of his uh, launch facilities are out in West Texas, uh, high desert uh, karst limestone formation. Um, but we, we knew that we wanted to work underground um, and to make this thing last. And we wanted this kind of experience that people would hike up and and enter in to the uh, the site in almost like a old mine or an, even a natural cave looking setting. They'd go through the whole clock site and then be come out at the top um, after seeing the clock and and having maybe being there for one of those synchronization solar synchronization moments. Um, and you'd leave through a much more um, uh, man made type of uh, type of environment and. and just again to kind of give you one example of the type of problems that we solved on this project we wanted to work uh in the negative in rock uh basically and kind of by carving it um, but there really aren't good tools for that um right now and and um, the only thing that was close was the way that they cut marble out of carrara uh italy um, with these giant uh, diamond chainsaws and um, or band saws um, and so we actually got one of those and um, adapted the blade it's a nine foot diamond belt uh, belt blade that um, that we then could cut out um, these parts of the stairs and then break the the plates of rock out in between them and then what we were left with 
was uh, these kind of beautifully carved stairs where actually the stairs taper from the bottom of the site to the top. So every single cut was different. So it would, it would not have worked um, as a human operate, human cut operation. So this, this robot uh, ran for two years cutting uh, 300 feet of stairs for us. And, um, and then just getting to the actual parts of the clock itself. Um, one of the most recently uh, installed parts on the clock is the chime generator, which uh, can ring a series of 10 bells in a different sequence each day for 10,000 years. And so there's these 10 bells that we had specially engineered um, to ring in um, a kind of an octave lower than their normal size. And then this mechanism is probably the, the largest single mechanism within the clock. It's about 80 feet tall and 60,000 pounds. Uh, mostly of stainless steel. The, the bells themselves are a special type of bronze. Uh, most of the axles uh, in the clock are made out of titanium and then all of the bearings in the clock are made uh, of solid ceramics with no lubrication. There's, not, uh, there's no place in the clock where we use lubrication because it simply couldn't last long enough uh, for, for that use. Um, and this, this install happened um, before COVID hit. Um, so we've been slowed down by installation on the site, but we're still working on finishing the last parts of the clock that will show you the dials and, and have that parts like the solar synchronization that I mentioned before. And that's where we are with the clock. Um, we're nearing completion on it, but not quite there yet. Um, and I mentioned uh, at the beginning also this idea of, um, of a library. When Stuart mentioned this idea of a library, the first projects that we started thinking about is like, when you're talking about a 10,000 year library, you know, it's not just platform dependence of like digital data or, um, or even um, the print medium, but actually it gets down to language, right? Um, we, you know, things like the Rosetta Stone showed us that, you know, even only a, a few thousand years, you can lose whole languages and scripts and not understand how to reinterpret them. Luckily, this object was found by one of Napoleon's soldiers and after a 50 year decoding effort gave us uh, much more insight into hieroglyphics. Um, but we thought we'd make a modern version of the Rosetta Stone as kind of a disc that's kind of has information as dense as some of our digital storage medium, um, or at least in that, in that magnitude, um, but that uh, could last for thousands of years and be read with much lower technology. And so we created this a uh, disc called the Rosetta disc, where one side of it um, kind of gives you a key and tells you what's on it um, and a list of languages. And the other side had uh, nearly 15,000 pages of micro etched uh, data that was etched in, this created with a gallium ion beam, similar to um, how we make uh, prototype circuits. But instead of writing circuits, we wrote uh, actual text. And then uh, these thousands and thousands of pages of, of text can, uh, can be read with a microscope. So kind of 17th century technology can read this and it gives us access to over 1500 languages instead of just the, um, the, the two languages and three scripts that was on the original Rosetta Stone, but hopefully should be able to last as long. And one of these uh, early prototypes of the Rosetta disk that we created was launched on the ESA's Rosetta mission and was on the, the orbiter um, that uh, arrived at the uh, comet 10 years later, this is now uh, back in 2014 that it landed um, and continues to orbit uh, the sun about every six and a half years to this day. And so those are the projects, uh, the kind of two main core projects at Long Now. We have other projects around uh, betting uh, of, of things of long-term science and consequence uh, called Long Bets. We have spun off projects like Revive and Restore where um, using, uh, designing ways of using genetic engineering for bringing back extinct species. But these, uh, the Rosetta project and the clock project were our two first core projects. Um, but one of the most recent areas of research that I'm working on is trying to figure out um, you know, how the longest lived institutions have stayed around. And, you know, as you look through these lists of the oldest uh, companies and universities in the world, you, know, you start to see some, some trends in here where it's like, first of all, a lot of them are in Japan. Um, second of all, many of them are breweries and confectionaries and, and kind of these um, and, and family run hotels. Uh, things like that. And then uh, universities show up around 1000 AD um, and obviously have, have stayed with us ever since. Um, but trying to understand, you know, in some cases, some of these um, 
some of these institutions are, have very unportable reasons for why they've stayed around. Like if you're the Royal Confectioner of Japan, you have one customer and that customer has survived, so it worked out. Um, but um, I'm kind of more interested in potentially some of these um, construction companies or, or other things that have also lasted. But I think it is it's worth knowing that um, some of the oldest companies in the world are, are all in this kind of interesting service industry of food and beverage, um, which makes sense because it's kind of universal, universal needs. Um, the other uh, thing that's interesting is it's coming up in the research is, is really just how, um, how much shorter the lifespan of uh, the Fortune 500 companies has become. And basically, we're, we're losing almost one year per year of life in the Fortune 500. And so, you know, back in 1950, uh, average Fortune 500 company was 61 years old. And now it's down to actually, it's even less than this now. This is uh, less than 18 years now. Uh, but again, some of the oldest ones here uh, in the Fortune 500, most of them are in services, uh, in this case, mostly financial ones. And then as you really start looking over the list of some of the oldest companies, for instance, that uh, companies that are over 200 years old, as I mentioned, um, vast majority are in Japan. Other interesting thing that came up is really something about scale, which um, I think is probably a really important component of how things last. Obviously, if you're if your only model for how your company or your software or um, or anything is is growth um, and, and your only gauge for success is growth, then at some point you're going to you're going to max out. And so it's interesting to me that um, you know 90% of the companies that are over 200 years old have less than 300 uh, employees. These are not huge companies, and and a huge percentage of even that really only have you know less than ten or twenty. This you know what what types of organizations survive? It's these th uh, these kind of key components of of uh, of of human experience of coming together. Um, you know, sake, beer, wine, hotels, restaurants. Um, these are these are all the kind of things that humans have to do, no matter how long uh, the company is around. Um, also making things really remote, as you saw, the site that we have for the clock is, is quite remote. This is a picture I took at the, um, the Global Seed Vault in Svalbard. It's designed to last for a thousand years. It has, uh, it's a repository of uh, the world's um, crop seeds. Um, and I think what's also interesting about remoteness, it's, it's helpful for lasting long. You're not in this churn of cities and things like that. But also it's, it kind of creates its own um, kind of mythic quality. I was, I was, this is the, the guest book that I signed at this, at the seed vault. Um, you know, it's, it's 800 miles north of the, the most northern part of Norway up in an archipelago. And, um, and I was signing my name after Ban Ki-moon and Jimmy Carter and all these other dignitaries and people have flown all the way to this corner of the earth just to see this, um, this, the seed vault. And, um, and so there's something about it, that remoteness that, um, that also can create um, a mythic quality that helps things survive. Um, the other way to last for a really long time is just to take a really long time to build build the thing that you're working on. Uh, cathedrals are famous for this. This cathedral in Cologne uh, was started in 1248 and wasn't considered finished until 1880. Um, you know, you, the cathedral, the Sagrada Familia, and uh, that. Uh, Gaudi was one of the architects of, um, is now on its third architect. It's 125 years into its build process um, and is already considered a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which I think is interesting um, that something that's under construction and not even completed could be considered a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but it seems to be on a good path to be preserved for quite a long time. Um, another uh, another interesting one to me is this idea, and I think it's very relevant to the open source uh, world, is that we have many examples of things that um, that have lasted for millennia that are not because of uh, a top-down structure, but more because of a community of practice. And uh, martial arts are a great example. Um, you know, yoga is a good example, um, and and even you know some games like chess and things like that. I would say are good examples. Um, but certainly, this is um, the path that a lot of things like um, like open source software seem to be on. Is how do you make a community of practice that allows something to last and grow, but um, but kind of retain its core? And I think you know just the other kind of things to keep in mind as we're looking forward, um, and if we're 
if any of us are trying to build things that are going to last a long time, you know, we uh, there's a there's going to be a changing world over the next hundred years in both demographics and climate. Um, you know, this is just showing um, some of the agricultural where the agricultural years are going to be getting better as climate change happens. I think it's interesting to see that you know countries like um, the United States, Canada, and Russia are kind of going to be uh, winners as well as some of the Nordic countries are going to be winners in the climate change um, productivity in terms of agricultural yields and, and other things, whereas the most of the population of the world is coming from the global south. And so that's obviously um, setting us up for some pretty bad tensions. Um, and then world population itself, you know, we have, we have, as, as human species, we've always assumed that there's going to be more people, there's going to be growth economics, all these things. But um, many of the scenarios that are now being looked at were as fertility is is going down, meaning just families are having less babies as uh, urbanization happens and electrification happens of uh, of of countries and different parts of the world. In general, people are having less kids, and there's still more kids being being had in the the global south. But that's starting to change. The global north is already basically on a negative path, and um, and so we're seeing. Um, that not only that we're going to have, we're going to peak in population in the next, you know, within the next century, um, but we're also going to have this, uh, this population that is getting older and older um, bef as we peak. And so we're going to have less young people in the, in the system. And in Japan, uh, when that happened, um, it kind of tanked the entire economy because you just, young people tend to work harder. They tend to spend their money, not save it. Um, they, um, they tend to have a lot of the, uh, you know, new ideas in culture. And so I think these are all things that are, we, you know, we're often worried about how big the Earth's population is going to get, but I think we should be equally paying attention to what happens on the other side of this, um, because if all of our e economics are growth-based um, and we start to go into a declining population, that's going to be a very different world than the way we started this century. And I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just kind of finish up with um, just reminding uh, you all um, that Really, if you you know if you added up the thousands of generations before us, um, the dead add up to about a hundred billion people currently living around seven point uh, seven billion. Um, but if you really if you think about the thousands of generations ahead of us, that's six point seven five trillion uh, people that that are the unborn. And how do we give them voice in the projects that we're working on? How do we design things so that that the future generations look back at us and go, wow, these guys are the people who scattered those acorns on the ground and, um, and then tended to them so that when we needed to solve the unsolvable problem, um, that the resources were there. And I think um, well, this is a great um, slide that I adapted from uh, Roman Kuznerik's recent book called The, the Good Ancestor. Um, and it's, uh, it's a, a really clarifying way, I think, to think about how we um, our designing for the future. And with that, um, hopefully uh, Denise and I will have a chance to talk over some of these issues and others. Thank you. Wow, that was a great talk. At least I thought that was a great talk. And what I know that you don't know is there's actually quite a bit more of this talk. I had to edit it down to the time slot we had available. But um, we're going to be releasing a director's cut of this that will include um, about half an hour of Q&A between Xander and I uh, after he gets through the talk. But the talk also um, in its entirety has a lot more examples and it is very interesting. So uh, I hope that you will check that out as soon as we put it up on our YouTube channel after the conference is over. And um, thank you so much.